Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Daniel G. Garza, and this is another episode of Put It Together Conversations. Welcome to the show. I want to welcome everybody watching us on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. Thank you for being part of the show. Remember that you, too, can be part of the conversation. Make sure you go into the videos and check it out, and uh, then uh, join in. Any questions, any comments for my guests, you're welcome to be part of it. If you're watching us on YouTube, do me a favor. Will you scroll down, hit that subscribe button? and the notification bell that will let you know every time there's a new show on the page, along with uh, Christian and Daniel's show, The Card Devo, Bridging the Conversations, and uh, Breakfast Readings from TikTok. All those go up in the air. And don't miss my Monday morning uh, horoscopes. Those are up on the YouTube page as well. So make sure you follow us. Uh, for today, my guest is Bobby Kahn. And let me tell you a little bit about her. Bobby Kahn was born in Moorhead, Kentucky and raised in a nearby holler where she developed a deep connection with the land and her Appalachian roots. She obtained her bachelor's degree at Brea College, the first school in the American South to integrate racially and to teach men and women in the same classrooms. After struggling as a single mother, she worked multiple part-time jobs at once to support her son and to attend graduate school, where she earned a master's degree in English with an emphasis in creative writing. In addition to writing, Bobby loves playing pool, cooking, being in the woods, attempting to grow a garden, and spending time with her incredible children. Uh, with much more, let me bring on. Hi, Bobby. Welcome to the show. Hi, Daniel. Thank you. How is it going on your end? Everything is good here. Uh, waiting for it to start storming soon. So we will see okay. how that goes. All right, that, that's that's a new one. It's like, yeah, we're just waiting for the storm to come in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, you're in Kentucky, correct? Yes, I'm actually in Berea, where I went to college. Um, oh, nice. Like some time ago now. Yeah. So is it a big storm place there? Do you guys get a lot of like hurricane weather, I guess, would be kind of? We, we don't get hurricanes. We get tornadoes sometimes. Um, but Berea is kind of in a little geographic or top, topographic bowl. So sometimes the weather um, skips over us and then sometimes it seems to just hang out and uh, sort of pound down for a while. But I love summer storms, so I can't complain, but my dog does not, so <laughs> I feel better. Well, having been raised in Dallas, I definitely know about tornadoes because we have Dallas is right in Tornado Alley. And yes, there is something about summer rain and the thunder and the lightning and then mm -hmm. the, the, the aromas that come from that it's just here in california we don't get much of that so i i miss it i miss it sometimes yeah, uh so for everybody wondering how i know bobby uh i know her through uh light bulb we're both light bulb ambassadors i'm part of their recovery group and the cancer group yeah, and I am um, one of the, I'm in the, I'm a, sorry, care partner in the addiction space um, because they entered the addiction disorder space last year, I believe. Yeah. So I joined in as a care partner because um, addiction has certainly had a huge role in my family at different times. Um, and of course, it takes all of us to try to help everyone understand how to deal with that and um, to support the people we love. Yeah. Addiction is definitely a ripple disease. It, it, it's not just the person going through the addiction. It's everybody that it touches after that ripple. So if you want more information on light bulb, addiction, cancers, uh, some of the newer parts of life bulb right now is transplants. So if you want more information, just go check it out right here at the website, lifebulb.com. And thank you, the folks at Lifebulb, for bringing us all together because we have meetings and we get to talk to each other and connect with each other. So um, we have our, our, our first one. Oh, somebody's saying hi to you already. Uh, oh, it's our friend. Uh, uh, it's my friend, Piper. Hi, Piper. Welcome to the show. Uh, but you're, I, we're going to talk about your book a little more in a little bit. Um, I was reading your book before the show started. And so much. So I'm going to shut up now because I want to hear your story. So Bobby Khan, tell us how you put it together. 
Well, thank you. And I love it that your show is, is about people telling their stories because obviously since I've written a memoir, I'm very excited um, and, and passionate about the idea of telling my story and also helping other people tell theirs um, because I really think personally for me, learning to tell my story in a, in a very different way and claiming ownership over my story um, and kind of rewriting it both mentally, like psychologically, emotionally, and then also physically in such a way that I am someone with agency in my story. Um, that was a really transformative experience for me and it was a lot of work and, um, you know, it's, it's to me what gives my life purpose. So, um, yeah, very meaningful to me. And this is my memoir, In the Shadow of the Valley. Um, basically, I always think of my story as starting when I was a child, um, four or five years old in this holler in Eastern Kentucky. Um, you know, and, and I'm someone who has a lot of vivid memories um, like a lot of my childhood just feels like it was just yesterday. Um, I grew up in a really gorgeous place. Um, a lot of Eastern Kentucky hollers for, for whatever problems there might be there. Um, the beauty is just unparalleled. Um, so I spent a lot of time in this gorgeous place. Um, but also grappling with some of the socioeconomic issues that accompany life in Appalachia and Eastern Kentucky. Um, and then also dealing with, you know, things that happen in the lives of girls and women, um, things that just happen in lives of people all over the world. And then as I grew older, it took some time for me to really, you know, claim the ownership over my life. I went through a lot of it feeling like a victim and feeling powerless. Um, and writing my memoir was a big part in me shifting that perspective. And, um, you know, I've done a lot of self work to, to get to where I feel like I'm not just telling my story, but also owning my story, loving my story, even with the ugly parts of it um, and just able to really appreciate, you know, whatever life brings and what it, what it has brought as well. You know, even the unpleasant stuff. That's pretty cool. We already have a question for you on the board. Oh, uh, okay. Bobby, how did you find out the historic parts of your story that you might not have been present for? What were your sources? So, you know, anytime you write memoir or anything where you're relying on memory, of course, you have to be careful to explain, um, you know, that, that you are basing it on your own memory. And then there were things that I shared in my memoir that I was told, um, stories that my parents told me um, about my great grandparents, for instance. Um, and of course, I just always have to be really clear, where is my information coming from? Um, by and large, my memoir focuses on my memories that are, um, you know, my direct stories. So, and not so much stuff that I wasn't actually present for. Um, and it, it also helped that I started writing it in my twenties. Um, so, you know, a lot of that was even more vivid then than it might have been um, by the time it got published if I had written it all, you know, 15 years later, because it did take a while for it to get published. Not, was it 15 years? Maybe 14 years. Wow. I, I And I see I, in your book, she does put at the beginning, uh, uh, in the author's note, that like these are events that happened several days ago. Some of my stories are based on what I was told by others. And that's really, I mean, that's that's so crucial because I, I feel like some of the stories, like for instance, I've been make, taking notes and writing my memoir on little parts. And some of the stories that I know of me as a kid are just stories that I 
heard mm-hmm. growing up. I mean, how many of us don't have that? When you were a kid, and every time you see that one uncle or aunt, you hear that same story. Well, when you were a kid, and you're like, okay, so it must be true if there's if they yeah. say it so much. Does that make sense? Yeah, and you know, it's so. I think the interesting thing about that is, like, you might not have that memory firsthand, but that is it sounds like the foundation of this interaction with the, that specific uncle, right? Or this one specific relative likes to tell you the same story over and over. And I have relatives who do that too. Um, And it's like, you know, that's storytelling is that I think the heart of what it means to be human. We tell ourselves stories about who we are and that's how we create culture. Um, And that, that has a lot to do with how family dynamics are formed and, you know, our, our family mythologies are formed. Um, so there's something really sweet about even the fact that other people have memories of you that you don't have yourself and those memories matter to them. Yeah. Do you think that some of those stories like started to form who you are now, even though you don't remember them or you don't remember being present for them, but, uh, I don't want to give up too much of your book, but there is a part in your book where you're talking about your dad sending you to your grandmother's house to deliver mm-hmm. a message. And I'm not going to say what the message was because you don't need to read the book, but um, I don't know if you, I'm sure you remember that part, but where she, like, you talk oh, yeah. about him. And it's so vivid. The way you write is so vivid. Um, like, you're, he's kneeling down to look at you in your eyes, kind of like, go deliver this message. And you're like, I really don't know, but. Like, did that start forming who you thought you were as you grew up? Did, did that, does that make sense? Oh, yeah. I mean, I I remember that experience very vividly, you know, and it, it and I tried to convey this in the book, too. Like, part of me, I think, grew up because it's an unpleasant message that he sent me to deliver Um, So, you know, and I I loved my granny. She was just so dear to me. Um, So I think part of me grew up thinking like, I am this person who could do something hurtful to someone I loved, you know, and, and it took, I didn't have the courage to defy my father. um, And I felt powerless. And, you know, at like five years old, you are kind of powerless. Uh, when it comes to the adults around you. But, you know, it took me a very long time to be able to sort through that and say, like, oh, just because I went along with this horrific thing at the age of five doesn't mean that I am that person. You know, I was not, I was not the same as my father. I didn't want to participate in the kinds of cruelties that he did. Um, But yeah, it, it, there was a lot of shame and guilt that accompanied that for a very long time. Okay, I don't know if you noticed, but as you were talking about not falling into that, your 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 screen got really bright all of a sudden. <laughs> so I don't know if that's like a, a message from somewhere saying, no, girl, you ain't going to be no victim. We're going to pull you out of that. And that, that's my next segue question. Considering how much damage could have been done and how much, how, well, my first question is, when did you first have, like, do you have that first memory of, this is me, like, this, this is Bobby Khan, like, I, I, I I realize that I'm alive, that I'm here, does that make sense? Yeah, um, this might sound a little strange, but, so I was, I was in a gifted program in fourth grade, we had to um, fill out a sheet about ourselves to introduce ourselves to the class. Um, And I was painfully shy. And I was, you know, I felt like I didn't belong because it seemed like all of them were comfortable and happy. And they also were into like popular culture at the time. I was just like, 
I listened to old country music, you know, at our house. So my favorite musician when I was nine was George Jones. And, um, you know, we didn't get television really up at the house. So I couldn't come up with a favorite television show. <laughs> um, so, but one thing this questionnaire asked was, if you could be anyone else, who would you be? And I was sitting in this chair trying to figure out what to put. And I realized, I thought, well, I wouldn't want to be someone else because it, if I wasn't me, someone else would have to be me. And I wouldn't want anyone else to have to do this. I have yeah. to do this, you know? And I was just kind of like, well, in my little mind, I was still thinking this sucks, right? Um, not with, not in that language, but um, just thinking it's kind of awful. And I just wouldn't want anyone else to have to do this. So that was my first moment that I recall of being like self-aware. Wow. Um, and then after that, by the time I was about 15, you know, I was trying to do things like meditate and um, read spiritual texts because I really, I was starting to reject Christianity, but I really was searching for spiritual connection and, um, you know, and, and still I went back and forth between being like self-aware, meditate, you know, that kind of thing. And then doing very, very self-destructive things. Um, so I was like bouncing back and forth constantly. And it felt like I was just sort of wrestling with the ocean, trying to find um, a place to stay still. Got you. For everybody watching, this is Put It Together Conversations. I'm your host, Daniel Jigarza. My guest today is writer Bobby Kahn. And we're talking about self-discovery uh, childhood memories and uh, things that we never knew, but we know somehow. Uh, along the lines of that question, um, when did you in your path decide, I will not be a victim to the circumstances? You know, I think I had to decide that several different times. Um, I would say... I was probably in my early 20s the first time I started thinking in terms of victimhood, um, but I didn't understand like how deeply that was rooted, you know, and still I learn more and more as I work on myself and um, try to sort through like the impact of trauma. Um, so yeah, but so it's been a journey uh, since my 20s, but I wanted to show you, like, I have these two little rings on that I wear. And um, each time I bought myself one of these rings, it was, they were both in my 20s. And it was because I one day realized I was, um, you know, I'd been in a destructive relationship and I had not been taking care of myself. So I bought myself the first ring as a little promise to myself that I would take care of me. And then, you know, a few years later, I realized I kind of lost my way again. And I bought myself another little ring as a reminder to take care of me. Cool. And um, yeah, now I feel like I can say my promise is kept. Um, but it wasn't instant, you know. It's very cool. It says, uh, Piper Stell says, isn't it crazy how we wouldn't wish our lives on anyone else? Hey, man, to that girl. I, I can I can relate to that one, too. It's like, uh, like I, it's, there are times when I wish somebody else would step in for a little while mm -hmm. to see things through my eyes. But then a part of me goes, I don't think somebody else could handle my life and, and do it. Does that make sense to you? Oh, yeah. I think, uh, you know, once we kind of find our footing, it's like, you, you realize that you're the one that's got what it takes to, to be you and to be your authentic self. It's the part where we're struggling and, and it hurts to be in that, you know, to be in your body or to be dealing with your thoughts day in and day out. Um, that's, that's not fun. 
but I, I, I've also discovered because I just turned 50, I've also discovered in my 50 years, now that I'm a little older, I won't say wiser or more mature, but I, I am older. But there is this like, um, like I wouldn't be me without the pain, and I wouldn't enjoy that the happiness without the pain. So the pain is part of Daniel G. Garza's story, and it's so important. And this is to segue because I, I took notes from your book. Um, I am on this path that is hardly comprehensible. I loved that line. Just loved it. it it's like, I, why is it not on a T-shirt and being sold on <laughs> it? Uh, can I ask you to break down that sentence for us, it, what you meant? Yeah. Um, you know, I was thinking that, like, when you, when I look at my life at, at any stage that I've been at, but especially when I was struggling more, um, it, it never felt like there was some, like, clear trajectory. And all around me, it seems like so many people have had this kind of clear trajectory of their lives. Um, and I think stability had a lot to do with that. Like when I looked at my classmates, for instance, in high school or college, you know, a lot of them seemed to be moving forward um, with a plan in mind. Right. Or they followed in their parents' footsteps and they did things the way you're supposed to, like get a degree, get married, then you have babies and then you've you've got a career, that sort of stuff. And for me, um, you know, I was bouncing around between like doing self-destructive things and then being a vegan and trying to go to college. And I had a baby in college. And then I was, you know, I tried to enter the workforce and I just felt like a fish out of water everywhere I went. Um, it just felt like the world wasn't for me. And, and it felt like every, it was for everyone else, but I just didn't belong anywhere I went. Um, you know, and yet still, thankfully, things got better incrementally um, and that there were some really, really dark times, um, but, but my life is a thousand times better than I would have imagined five years ago, 10 years ago, and certainly 20 years ago, you know, um, there's a really great poem that uh, it's, it's, I believe originally in Spanish, um, but the translation, basically there's a line that says something like, there is no path. Um, shoot, I, I wish I had it in my mind better. But anyway, so this poem, it's about wayfarers and it's, it's basically saying there is no path. The path is formed when you take the next step forward. That's what creates the path. And I have to remember that sometimes, like I'm not off a path. I didn't fail to follow the right path. You know, the path is created by the steps I take. Um, and my, my direction just happened to be um, messy. <laughs> yeah, I think we, a lot of us could use that word. But I, it's really interesting because in, in spiritual coaching, I... I tell people when they come to me and they're like, I feel so lost. I'm like, you're not lost. You're just, ne you've just never been here before. So it's new, but it's, it's your life. It's your journey. So you're not lost. This is all new and you get to decide the next step you take. So that's really interesting that you, that you bring that up. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think um, life feels really overwhelming and scary for a lot of people. Um, when you feel like, there's something you're supposed to be doing and you're not doing it or you're supposed to be somewhere or to reach certain goals and you just haven't yet. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I build my path with the bricks thrown at me. Amen. Nice. I mean, I think for a lot of us who are, um, and I'm going to bring back addictions and alcoholism and anybody who's been in that circle, who's lived in that world, either, like me, where I was the center or those affected, um, 
there's a lot of bricks that come with that. There's like, it, it's like, yeah. And, and, and so you definitely, I feel like the path that I formed, a lot of those bricks are, <laughs> are, 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 from, are the, where my bruises came from. But the lessons learned, what has been, what, what was one of the, um, if you can think of one or a couple, it doesn't matter, but what was a lesson that you learned as you wrote your book and you had to relive and I, and I feel like now that you relived those moments, well, I guess first, was it more like a spectator now? Or did it take you back into the moment? And then what lessons did you learn from it? Um, it, it really still takes me back into those moments. Um, and there are some like stories within my memoir that are very painful for me still when I read them or um, you know, read them out loud or read them silently, I, either one. Um, but so when I, when I first started working on the story, one of my main goals was to make sure that I removed self-pity from the story because when I was writing it, you know, I realized like, you know, it's, it's an objectively difficult life at times but there are people who've had more difficult lives than me. And, um, you know, it's not entertaining or fun or illuminating or inspiring to just hear someone talk about how awful their life is. Right. Um, and I wanted, I felt like my story would only be important to others if it offers something to other people. Right. It, it needs to have a gift. It can't just be for me. Otherwise, it should just be a diary. So um, I tried to remove self-pity. And sometimes I would go back, you know, to edit something, um, revise a passage, and I would find a phrase or a sentence that felt like it had a little self-pity in it. And I just found that so off-putting. Um, but then having that exercise constantly of like, well, I want to remove it from the words, you know, so it also, I think, helped to remove it from my heart. You know, um, self-pity is one of the great hallmarks of victimhood. And while some people are truly victimized, um, you know, it, it's hard to find your power if you don't change your relationship with your experiences. So rewriting it forced me to change my relationship with the story. And I really loved that. And I, I realized, you know, it, it's, it's hard to describe exactly how transformative and liberating it is to tell your story when the, the act and the process completely transform you, you know, in the work. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a guided meditation exercise that I've done, and now I do it sometimes with my clients, where it's a timeline meditation where you go back to that moment in your life that changed the direction or the path that you went on. And... And you said this earlier, like you can't change what happened, but you can change the way it made you feel because now you know better. Like now I know, oh, that made me stronger in the moment. It sucked, but look at me now. And and you go back to you talk to that version of you at that age and go, it hurts right now. It sucks. But let me show you what the outcome was years later the bigger picture and it completely changes the way you look at a situation. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. Um, because, you know, in the moment of our suffering, sometimes we're not, we don't have the right tools. We're not equipped to deal with it, you know, graciously and gracefully, but we get there, right. You grow and you evolve and it is often those really painful experiences that give us tools that come in really useful later. Yeah. But man, that first time. Whew. Especially when it leaves us with residues of guilt or shame or, or, or 
or, or, or phobias or fears that not aren't ours. They're about the people around us. But we're so young that we think we own them. We think that they're ours. And that's such a difficult place to be. Um, before we continue, everybody watching you, this is Putting Together Conversations. I'm your host, Daniel G. Garza. We are speaking with writer Bobby Brown about her memoir and um, uh, not being a victim. Um, memories. There's another sentence that I wrote down that really got to me. I feel like I'm deconstructing your book. Let's talk about your book a little more. Uh, that's fine. that's why I wrote it. <laughs> but the older I got, the less clear it was where my home could be. And okay, I I, whew, I read that sentence and I was like, whew, like I remember several years ago, uh, I lived in Laguna for twelve years, and I remember several years ago thinking, if something happened to me, who would claim me as, you know, Dallas lived or. Laguna Beach resident or Monterrey, Mexico born, like who would claim me as their own? And I thought, I, I don't think I've been anywhere long enough for anybody to claim me. And when I read the sentence today, I was like, I just felt sad for that version of me that felt so lost. Um, what, what does that sentence mean to you? Can you break that down for us? Yeah. Um, you know, I think we, most of us have a deep longing, of course, to belong and for connection. And the, the concept of home is the, the beginning of that, right? And we're supposed to have this foundation of, you know, where we belong, who loves us, um, where, where are we known and recognized for who we are. And ideally, that would be home. Um, you know, in, in childhood, even when it's not great, I think for a, a lot of us, not everyone, but even a lot of us who have difficult childhoods, wherever your home is for childhood is certainly like wrapped up in the, the magic of childhood and these like formative memories and experiences. So, um our, our attachment to like a childhood home or the home that we idealize, um, you know, I think that's a stand in for that, that need to belong, the need to feel loved and seen and connected. And, you know, again, for me, I didn't feel that much of anywhere. I felt it with like the wild land that I grew up with and particularly with my granny who lived right next to us. Um, but like culturally, I didn't feel at home there, you know, and especially when I went off and got an education um, at a university, which is kind of um, treated with a little, with some suspicion at times in our culture. Um, then, you know, I felt even more separated from home and uh, just rejected in various ways over the years. And now I think, you know, like I have a house and I want it to feel like my, my daughter's home and my son's home. And it feels like home to me. But I, I think going forward, home just has to be like something that I carry inside of me, you know, and it has to be something that I can, I can use to create a, a nurturing space, but that nurturing just, it has to come from within. If, if it's not coming from outside of you, you've got to find a way to create it inside of you. Right. Bobby, how did you, what was the message? Was it internal? Was it from somebody else? How did you, break those chains and and because there's a couple of other things that i related to you like number one um i was also part of a gifted group in in fourth grade fourth fifth and, and part of sixth but i was not supported by my family and now that you mentioned this part about oh you think you're better than us like you're oh you're going off to get an education um 
God bless my parents. They just didn't know how to be supportive in that aspect. So I kind of dropped out of it, didn't know how to keep going. Um, it took me many years to to recognize that there was an internal message that kept playing every time I tried to succeed that I finally had to delete from my memory. But how did you how did you break that chain and, and delete that message that was, I guess, generations? Well, so, you know, I had been spiritually seeking for quite some time since I was a teenager. And I think that that really was a, a very helpful thing for me overall. Um, so when I was in my late 20s, I had a realization one day. I was really miserable in my life. And um, I was thinking about different relationships and how these people that I was in, you know, a romantic relationship with or a friendship and, you know, maybe coworkers, whoever I was thinking how awful all of those relationships were, um, how unhappy I was about various aspects of my life. And then I realized the one thing that all of that had in common was, was me, like the people, the other people, they weren't just like each other, you know, they did and they didn't all know each other. So it really hit me like a ton of bricks that, you know, they weren't conspiring against me. There was no plan to make me miserable, but that for whatever reason, I had all of these unpleasant relationships and unhealthy and, you know, unhealthy relationships. So I, I realized it's like, Oh, it must be me. And I, I can't fix anything without working on myself. So I sought someone out who was, um, she was a life coach, but I kind of came through her or came to her through a more like kind of spiritual based, um, path. And I spent the next two years going to see her every week and saying like, you know, how do I make my life better? What do I need to do? And um, she helped me really examine my thought process and my underlying beliefs. And then to start, um, you know, she didn't tell me what to do, but she helped me see like, Hey, if you want to be financially stable, you know, you can't ignore your bills, even if you're afraid of them. And that's where I was at at that time. I was afraid to open my mail because I didn't know what what bills there might be and I didn't have money to pay them. And so, like, that's an example of one little step that I had to take to change my my whole life because I had, you know, I was just like ignoring my responsibility. Um and, and we worked a lot on my sense of, um, you know, success is the, the underlying belief that like succeeding is uh, betraying your people. Um, you know, when I was growing up, money was very, very tight. Um, so and my father often said things about bankers and the system and you know, so I grew up with all these messages that like money is bad. People with money are bad. The system is bad, you know, and, and we're victims and that's, you know, it's their fault and it's rich people's fault. So if you grow up with those kinds of messages, well, so money's bad. Having money is bad. makes you a bad person. Yeah. Then it's really hard to like consciously make good choices if you're subconsciously thinking that success is a horrible thing. Yeah. So yeah, you're a couple of years of really sorting through those underlying beliefs and it was pivotal. It was the most important thing that I think I've, I could have done. It's interesting how, how in the conversation we've gone from like the messages that, that's, that you had to delete to set you free from that chain. And that's what we were talking about in the very beginning. It's like all these messages that we have that are not even ours sometimes. That we've got. We have another question for you on the board. Uh, Bobby, do you utilize a family of choice in your life? Um, so let's see. Certainly, yeah. Um, I think, I, and I, 
correct me if I'm misunderstanding, but, um, you know, I have long felt like if you're not close to your birth family, you know, you, you have to create a family of your own. Yeah. I have been really fortunate that um, a lot of my blood relatives have shown me so much support since my memoir came out. And that was just a beautiful surprise. Um, you know, but I, I still have some people who I'm really close to that I formed relationships with that um, that feel like family to me. And I would say the most important sense of family, though, ultimately is, you know, I have two children. Um, they're older. One's in college and one is 13. So they're not tiny. And, you know, it's, we don't we don't have that kind of dependence anymore. But what I realized, especially since finishing my book, was that while I couldn't, I can't go back and have the childhood that I would would love to say I had, or um, to to have some of the feelings and some of the support that I longed for. But even better, I can give that to my kids, you know. And there's something really, really just beautiful and um, meaningful about knowing that, like, I know what I was missing. I know how it feels to not have that. And I am, I've worked on myself to the point where I can turn around and give it to someone else because it is so important. And, you know, my, I think my kids do know that I love them and they do feel supported and listened to, um, you know, my son and I talk about these kinds of things quite a bit. So it's, uh, they, they are my, my most important family and not because of what they can do for me, but because of what a gift it is to be a mother to them and to be the mother they need. That's pretty awesome. I, I think it's really cool that your that your blood relatives were like, "Hey, we're here for you and want to support you." Uh, Absolutely. Especially when if they see that you are succeeding in your own life, and they can see how breaking down those walls and releasing those messages can do for you, then other again the ripple people in your ripple line will be like, hey, I want to do that for me too. I want to, I want to let go of some of those. Yeah. Um, and there's, and, and that's a big part of why I wrote my book the way I did. So, you know, the, the traumatic childhood often leads to a destructive, like teen life and young adult life, right? Because it's really hard to just like wake up one day and not be this traumatized person who's making terrible decisions. Um, I mean, for a lot of us, not everybody. But um, I included a lot of my not proud moments, you know, from especially my young adult years, because I could, I knew when I wrote the book, there were times I was like, oh, some people are going to judge me for this, and I really don't want to put it in there. But then I thought, I know I'm not the only one who's done stupid stuff. I'm not the only one who's made choices that I'm ashamed of. And if I put it in there, if I'll be courageous enough to put it in there and own it, it is going to help free someone else. It's going to show somebody else like, hey, you're not the only one either. You know, we we all screw up and it's OK and you're still, you know, there's still hope. You're still worthwhile. So, yeah, um, that was a big part of why I wrote it the way I did. And and certainly it's a really vulnerable uh, yeah. experience. We usually get brave enough to op create and open our own doors when we see others go through theirs and, and, and what comes out on the other end. Because I know that recovery for me 14 years ago and uh, that the work that I do now is all because I saw somebody else walk through that door and be like, huh, wait a minute, there's there's transformation through that door. I want transformation. I want to transform. 
Um, for everybody watching, this is Putting Together Conversations. I'm your host, Daniel G. Garza. My guest today is uh, writer Bobby Kahn, and we're talking about her book, Transformations, and uh, coming out on the other side. And uh, Bobby, usually at this point of the show is when I ask my guest to share some words of wisdom. And what words of wisdom would you have for the audience? Well, um, writing is a really powerful tool. So if I would encourage anybody who's interested in, you know, writing their story to certainly seek avenues to do that. Um, and even if you don't think you're a good writer, like writing is a really, it's a, it's a really incredible thing that engages our brains and our, our hands um, in a way that nothing else can. So, you know, you don't have to be the next like, Hemingway or, you know, whoever to, uh, to benefit from writing. And um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, life isn't over until it's over. So, you know, I, I, I suspect you, like me, I've had moments where I thought it's just not worth going on. There's no no moving on from this. There's no way it could be any better. And one of the most important things that's ever happened for me is hearing a little voice say, well, just give it time. Just give it a little time, you know? And I am just so incredibly grateful that I listened and just decided to give it time. And I did so in a defiant way, you know? I wasn't like grateful to hear that, I was just like, whatever, okay, <laughs> fine, you know, but I did. I can understand that one. I, I, I've argued with that voice many a time. Like, <laughs> how dare you tell me what to do? Right. Uh, well, speaking of little voices, do you remember the day that you, like that little voice said, Bobby, write a book? Yeah. Um, so I had, I started this memoir in graduate school, I, you know, I focused on creative writing um, and it was time to come up with a thesis. And so this started out as my creative writing thesis and it was much shorter, um, you know, like what, maybe a, a tenth or so wow. of what's, of what's there now and, and it's transformed a whole lot. But um after I finished that is when I realized, you know, because I'd written all these stories down that I'd never written down before and I'd shared at times here and there, but never in some like succinct way. I realized I was like, oh, I've been through quite a bit, you know, and and even then I thought, well, if I can find the beauty in my story, then I can I can help others try to find the beauty in theirs. You know, if I can find through good storytelling, if I can make my story something others enjoy, it will elevate it to art rather than just one more miserable life that got lived, you know, and just sort of passes with time. Um, so yeah, that was my like twofold inspiration. That's very interesting. Uh, for any potential writers out there, anybody who's looking to write their memoir or, or a story, what's a couple of uh, helpful tips that you could pass along? Well, I, I think that having um, a good either network of, of writers or a mentor is just invaluable. Um, for me, grad school was really great because, you know, I was with other people who were pretty serious about writing and I got to work with some really great professors who are very serious and also, you know, encouraging, but honest. Um, so to me, the, the honest feedback is really important because I, I didn't want to have any delusions about what I was doing and whether I was accomplishing what I wanted to accomplish or not. Um, and, you know, as 
as a writer and maybe as any kind of artist, you know, a lot of whether it's good or not is subjective in other people's eyes. So, um, you know, if you can go through a good writing program, or join workshops, um, you know, there's, there's also like book coaches and those kinds of people who can help, help you if you're not, you know, wanting to do it start to finish on your own, but you, you know, depending on what kind of time and resources you can invest, um, the, there's a lot of opportunity out there. And, um, and a good editor is also key. Um, and a good editor will sometimes irritate you, right? Because <laughs> you, you don't want to change what you've done or you, you write something that you think is great and they're like, well, it's not accomplishing anything though and you have to get rid of it. Um, so it's a lot of work, but um, you know, it's, it's definitely worthwhile. And certainly I, I, it's another thing where it's never too late. You know, I've had women in their 50s, 60s, 70s reach out to me and say, oh, you know, I lived similar to you. I had these experiences. Um, some of them say like, nobody knows my story, you know? And it's like, well, I don't want your story to just pass with you. You know, you don't, and you don't have to write a whole book, but gosh, these stories are what connects us. Yeah. It makes sense. My, my mom passed uh, a year ago and she had so many stories that she would share with me sometimes that like I wish I could go back who I am now as, as a communicator and go back now and go, please, let's record some of these. Uh, so for anybody watching, yes, like I, I'm Bobby has her book. I'm very fortunate that I have a, a stage where I can ask people questions and share some of my story, but don't wait too long. Write your story. It, it's already important to one person to you. So write that story out. And, and I think anybody who's been in, in any kind of form publishing or writing or anything, we all have that editor that it's like, I, I used to fight with, when I was writing my kid's book, I was like, well, don't you understand what I'm trying to say? Like you should, like everybody should be in my head knowing it. Um, is, is there, was there one point in your book where you said, I'm not doing this. I'm, 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 I'm just not going to do it. Um, with this one, I'm not sure. I mean, there were certainly times like I got specific feedback from my editor and I was, there were moments where I thought, well, I'm not going to do, I'm not making that change, you know, like do a little work and figure out what I'm talking about or you know, you should remember that I, I said this like three chapters ago. And of course, then I had to realize like, well, who am I writing the book for? Is it for me? So I can go and read it over and over? No, it's it's for readers. And a good editor is going to help you understand where a reader's going to get hung up. And if you have a good editor, you got to trust them. I am working on a novel right now. And um, yeah, it'll... I think it'll be early next year that it comes out. And of course I'll be announcing it on my website and social media and stuff whenever we get the pub date. But um, I got my first round of feedback from my new editor a couple of weeks ago. And it was so overwhelming when I first looked at it. I was just like, I quit. I can't do it. That's it's I'm done, you know, so much for being a writer. Right. But I'd already written this like 90,000 novel. It's just that the, the edits is a, it's a lot of work to go back and do that. I have, I, this visual, I have this visual like the world doesn't deserve my book. You don't need to be reading. <laughs> well, you know, and the novel, I, I have never written a novel before. Wow. And with the memoir, it's like, well, it's my story. So I know. I know it's real, right? If nothing else with a novel, I mean, you can write a novel that doesn't make any sense at all. Right. Or that people were like, 
it's just not interesting or it's just not, you know, it's not making any sense. So I didn't know what the feedback was going to be. And thankfully, it wasn't that kind of feedback. But it was um, it was just so discouraging to get any kind of uh, negative feedback that I just kind of freaked out for a few minutes. It, it, one of the books I remember reading is The Law of Love from Laura Esquivel. I read it several years ago. But it was one of those books that, that you were like, this doesn't make sense. Like mm. it was a novel, and you're like, "Oh, now I remember where this came from, or this object." Uh, and and then further down the book, she would bring it up, and you're like, oh, "I was right, I was right." But yes, yeah, so for everybody out there, yes, there are books out there that are like you're like, "What? Like I don't get it." And you, you have to wait. You have to keep reading to figure it out. Can you give us any uh, hints on what the novel is about? Yeah, um, it's a. It's like historical fiction meets magical realism. Um, so my great grandpa, as I was telling you earlier, uh, and it's in my memoir, he was a moonshiner. And I grew up hearing a lot of stories about him from my father, um, you know, who he killed, um, where he hid his moonshine, like uh, he was friends with Al Capone. And there was actually a newspaper clipping. It was a picture of him and Al Capone in prison together in their boxers with their arms around each other. And so anyway, there was all these, all these stories. Um, and I have some of my great grandfather's things. And um, as we were wrapping up my memoir before it was going to come out, I one day thought, Oh, I should do research and like write a book about him. And then I thought, no, I should write a book about my great grandma, who I had the privilege to actually know when I was little. And she was a very interesting character, too. Um, you know, and I don't have as many stories about her, but some. And so what I got inspired to do was to kind of uh, imagine her story, right, based on the stuff that I do know. And I don't, but I don't know enough for it to be like biography. And I think that's a good thing because really it allows me to explore um, the, these fictional lives with the ideas of a few things that really happened in my family's history. And to me, growing up in Eastern Kentucky was its own kind of magical realism, like growing up playing in the forest like I did. So, I first read Gabriel Garcia Marquez when I was 16 and just fell in love with that genre and that style of writing. Um, so I wanted to incorporate that into this novel too, because I feel like it fits culturally very well. Nice. Well, I hope you will come and share it with my audience when your book comes out. Oh, I'd love to. Cool. So you have an open invitation whenever that's ready to come back and join us. Thank you so much. We've come to the end of our time. Um, let me just, for everybody watching, uh, that is her website. If you want to check out her book, uh, I just posted a picture here. Oh, where are we? Uh, I just, there it is. I lost my eyes. There it is, In the Shadow of the Valley by Bobby Kahn, a memoir. Go check it out. Uh, you can find more information at her website. For the people that heard us in the beginning talk about, um, LifeBub, this is the website. Go check them out. We're both LifeBub ambassadors. Uh, for more information on them, go check out the website. Bobby, thank you so much again for sharing your time and, and, and letting me read part of your book. Uh, for everybody out there, it's not anything special. She didn't just do it to me. Go to her website. You can read an expert of her book on the website, and uh, it's really cool. I'm going to have to put the order in for mine because I, I want a copy of it. Uh, thank so you. Sure that. Uh, I'm going to put you in the green room for just a minute, but thank you again so much for being on the show. I'll talk to you just a little bit. Yeah, thanks so much. For everyone watching, thank you so much. This has been another episode of Put It Together Conversations. Remember to catch us every day of the week. There's a show for you. Um, everything, uh, Christian and Daniel show on Wednesdays, The Card Devo on Fridays, and Put It Together Conversations on Saturdays with two episodes at noon and five. And occasionally we throw in a special episode. So make sure you subscribe and follow our pages to get information on any new shows that we throw out there a surprise during the week. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, 
YouTube, and LinkedIn. And if you're on YouTube, will you do us a favor? Scroll down, hit that subscribe button, and follow us. for uh, You'll get notified whenever a new show pops up. This is my book, Grumpy Bunny and the Colors Game, written by me and illustrated by Jennifer and Vivian Gatch. It's a story for kids about guided meditation, but you don't have to be a kid to read it. You can find it in any one of these five uh, outlets. Go check it out, Grumpy Bunny and the Colors Game out now and uh remember putting together conversations to show about folks where you come from where you are now what the journey is like and the idea is to motivate and inspire other people to go after their dreams and goals and i hope that today's conversation has motivated and inspired you uh we'll see you next time i'm daniel garza thank you for watching Bye bye